Hello, my name is Tim. I am the person who created the tool paths for the butt on chair. And today I will be walking you through my process of creating the paths as well as the layers they're associated with. Okay, hello, how's it going? Um, I'm gonna be walking you guys through today, um, hopefully, um, how to get through the butt on file for um, Core 360's butt on chair. Um, it's most likely going to be looking a little bit different on your computer than it is on mine. Um, you're probably going to have different software than I have and your computer's probably going to be a little bit different so I'm going to try to cover everything that I can here. Um, hopefully it'll give you guys uh, a little easier time um, getting this file loaded up and actually cut on the CNC. So with that said, um, the beginning, the first thing to do is going to be to open Aspire or whatever software you use to do your tool pathing um, for the CNC. We just happen to use Aspire here. So um, once you get your software open, um, you just need to navigate to wherever your um, to wherever the file is saved on your computer. Under here, it's it's called uh, but on master no lock bridle. I'm I'm not sure if, if it's going to be called that um, when you upload it, but. Anyway, it's going to come out looking something like this, only most likely it's not going to have the colors. Um, the colors in this case, I, I just do that so that I have an easier time um, differentiating between layers, which are over here. So I've already got all of the different paths layered out. Um, you're probably going to have to go through doing this because everything is most likely going to import into one layer and then you're going to have to go through and pick all these different layers out which I'm going to walk through with you today so hopefully um, you guys are able to do this on your own. Uh, this is my toolpath tab over here and, and the way that I set this up and um, this again is probably different from everybody else but I like to name the the layer that the that the actual artwork is on um, with the toolpath and I kind of line them up that way as well it just it helps it um, helps me just kind of stay on top of it mentally while I'm while I'm doing stuff because you can tell here um, despite the fact that that this chair is fairly simple and, and it goes together really simply um, it's a, a pretty uh, complicated and advanced um, toolpathing and, and layer um, layout here so um, let's, I suppose, just start with uh, the very first, first thing. I'm going to turn everything off right now, and we're going to start with just what I've called the tennis ball V layer here. Um, and that is eventually the little pocket that the tennis balls sit in. If you zoom in on it, it's just a circle. Um, and I've got four of them here um, just because I've got a, a copy of the tall chair that we offer and, and a, a copy of the short chair that we offer. Um, after you've gone through and got all your layers laid out, um, even before we get through the, even before we even get to the tool pathing, at this point you could take these and copy paste them um, to try to fill out the sheet as, uh, as, as best you can so you don't all have all this waste. But there's no need to fill the sheet up right now. I'm just kind of going to go over um, this with the two models of the chair and then and then it'll be your job to, to fill the sheet um, as best you can. So again, let's go back and start with the first, um, the very first thing that I've got, it's the tennis ball V and it really doesn't even have to be in this order. You, you guys can um, pick what what tools to use and what cuts to make in any order you want, but I've got these lined up um, the way that the tool changer works. So I have it T5 label over here because it's in, on my machine, um, it's the fifth tool um, in line. And I just kind of go down uh, five through one um, until the flip operation, which is um, part of the tricky thing about this, but we'll get into that later. So I start out with T5 and it's a V bit. If we click on the on the tool path itself, um, and I suppose we should actually probably just get right into setting up the tool path for this. Um, we set the depth. In this particular instance, I'm using a V bit that has an inch and a half diameter um, at the top. That would that would be up here, and you don't need to use a, a V bit that's that big. All it needs to do is um, cut three eighths of an inch into the into the surface. That's how deep this pocket is. So um, this is the bit that I've had and this is the bit that I use. Um, and so you import it in and um, 
and again, your software is probably a lot different than this, but I have this tool running on the artwork. Um, again, you can offset it on the inside or the outside, depending on how you want to end up achieving the cut that we're making here. But this is how I do it. So the tennis ball V, v layer is what I call it. Again, you can call it anything that you want. Um, gets associated with that, that bit of artwork and um, and then you set up the you set up however your machine works you set up your your tool path to cut it out and so if we preview this one this is what we end up with and that's just the start we're going to go through all of these and there's one two three four five six seven eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen layers that we need to work through in order to um, cut these chair parts out so down one let's turn on the scratch guides layer this is the layer that i've chosen to um, kind of mark the the little scratch guides on the bottom of the feet um, that you can use to cut the chairs um, on your own depending on how high or how low you want them to sit so um, I also use the scratch guide layer to do the little logo um, at the top of at the top of the stool so let's get into the scratch guide tool path it's the same bit so again it's labeled T5 um, because I'm using the um, fifth bit in my line that um, it's the same bit that I use for the for the for the V so they're both T5 um, again I, I only set the depth to this to point zero two you can go deeper or shallower if you want to um, but I've, I found that that was uh, a pretty good depth to make these lines um, you go through the whole thing I've got it cutting on the line um, I, again, I'm not I'm not going to spend a ton of time going through all the little things on on my machine because your setup is probably going to be entirely different than this. But after that's calculated, um, let's take a look at the preview. Oops, got to turn on the path that we want to see and preview visible. And for some reason, I can't see the scratches. Maybe it's just not showing up. Um, this preview, this preview window, the um, oh, what's it called? Anyway, we'll see how it works out when we're we're all done with it. I, I bet if I was to push this a little bit deeper, let's go point zero four, calculate. Yeah, okay, it's just not showing up. Um, it, this preview screen is doesn't have the best clarity so um, when it when it is actually done at point zero two which I'm gonna leave it at because that's that's where it cuts it actually does cut it even though it doesn't show it so let's go with that um, and there we go we've got two of the 13 tool paths done right there uh, we're gonna just work down the rest of the way right that now we're now we're doing the round over and this round over um, is used um, on the seats so there's a couple areas that we needed the corners rounded over so that they weren't sharp and this is the tool that I used to do that this is a 3 8 radius um, quarter round bit and um, I've got this designated as tool 4 so this is the I've got an automatic tool changer on my CNC some of you guys might not be so lucky to have that um, in which case all these are probably going to be you don't even need the tool um, differentiation because you're going to have to change the tool out by hand every time which is kind of a pain but um, that's how it goes I suppose alright so let's take a look at what this looks like and when we have the three that we've that we've got done so far Um, it looks like this. So we've got the, the very pocket for the tennis balls in there ready to go and you can't see the scratch guides. Alright, let's move on to the dog bone shoulder. Um, this is this is kind of just my own language. Um, there are clips that go on the top of um, on the very top of the stool uh, when the legs are assembled and the clips fit with the bottom portion of the seat 
and what round I want to show them. These clips uh, right up here actually end up fitting into the slots that are on the bottom of the seat. But in order to make the clip work the way it needs to clip, um, this slot needs a little bit of a shoulder. So a little bit later on down here, you can see the main dog bone. And the tool paths are slightly different. They're also cut to different depths. The main dog bone goes all the way through so that the clip can come through. And then the shoulder on the top is, is not as deep. Um, and the clip itself, if we zoom in on it, has a little bit of a kick out here. And that kick out ends up sliding over the top of that shoulder and it helps keep the seat um, on there really securely. So just to give you a, a run through of, of why I've named these the way that I have. Again, you could name these anything you want, um, just as long as it makes sense to you. Um, so dog bone shoulder, we're going to go over here and now we're going to get into the third tool that I use. And this tool is a um, quarter inch end mill. Um, I use a down cut end mill um, so I can avoid the tear out on the top of the plywood. Depending on what kind of plywood you're using, um, matter of fact this could be made out of solid wood if you if you wanted to to mill up enough material to put on the CNC and make it work. Um, but we use, we use the plywood, we use the Baltic birch here and the Baltic birch tends to tear out on the top of it if you use a regular um, up cut um, tool. So we use the down cut um, I'm going to go through this cut depth is quarter, quarter of an inch. Um, I'm going inside the lines on this one so we can see what that looks like. I'm going to actually have to choose. I actually think I have it all set up. Let's associate it. All right, now it's all these. Um, dotted lines are, are what this path is going gonna, is gonna, is gonna to cut. So when we calculate that and preview visible, there we go. There's the very beginning of the, um, the dog bone. Let's keep going. We are up to the rope holes. The way that this chair is actually held together are these holes in the seats. Um, some bungee cord goes through there and, and kind of keeps it all together. So we're going to keep on going through. I use the same tool with this one. I, I, it's, it's wise to try to use the same tool for as many of these diff, many operations as you can because it eliminates the amount of tool changes that need to happen in the process. Um, I think I've got this um, down pretty efficiently. If anybody figures out a way to, to do this more efficiently, then uh, by all means uh, feel free to do that and uh, let us know, by the way, if you uh, figure out a, a quicker, easier, more efficient way to do this. But I found that uh, five tools is about as efficiently as I could get it done. Um, but we're going to go through the same thing. I'm going to make sure that this tool path is associated with the proper, proper um, layers, which it is, and we're going to calculate that. Uh, this little warning comes up in my software letting me know that we're going to be cutting through the material. So um, make sure you've got your spoil board underneath there. Um, we're gonna, uh, I didn't mean to reset that. Let's highlight all the layers that we want visible. We are in rope holes. Um, okay, let's preview visible. And there we go. We're, uh, we're working through it, although I missed the dog bone shoulder. Let's preview that one. There we go. All right next to a path. We are moving on to the flip registrations. Now this is kind of, um, this is one of the tool paths that you don't necessarily have to do right now. I call it the flip registrations because in order to, in order to finish this chair, in order to make this chair work, some of these parts have to be flipped over and cut on the other side. And I use um, some of these holes that I've created which happen to be 0.3 inches in diameter. It, it's the same diameter as um, a, a snow marker that we use for the sides of the road. O up in Vermont here, it gets pretty cold and we get a lot of snow. And um, they have these fiberglass markers that you put in the ground to the, uh, on the sides of your driveways and then the snow plow knows how to stay on the road when the road is entirely covered with snow. Um, I found that, that those poles um, work really great to cut down and actually use to um, register your parts when you flip them. What I will do is go into my flip registration um, layer and you can actually see, let's see what ones are there, there's there, these two red 
dots. They're the same size as the other ones. I've just put them on different layers so that I can keep track of them. Um, and so that when I, um, when I tool path it, I can assign it to that layer and I don't have to go through an entire sheet and pick the tool path that I want to, that I want to pick in order to make the, the machine cut that one. So, um, these are the two row pole, or these, these, these two flip registration marks are what I us end up using to flip the part over and, and we'll actually demonstrate this in video um, when it comes time to that. But just know that you don't have to do the flip, the flip registrations right now. Actually, sometimes what I end up doing is if I'm doing a big run of these chairs, I will just go through and cut everything out and I won't even cut the registrations into the spoil board. Um, I'll do that after and I'll, I'll take the registrations and line them up and get as many, um, for example, this, this part right here ends up getting, um, is one of, the, one of the parts that gets flipped over and I'll just fill up an entire sheet with just those parts. Um, but for this registration, we are going to, or for this demonstration, um, I don't think we're going to do the flip registrations right now. We'll do that, we'll do that later. Um, so we're going to skip the flip registration layer and we're going to go to the main part of the dog bone which I showed you guys a little bit earlier. Um, and this is the same thing. I've got this in the same line. It's right underneath the flip operation, flip registration. So it kind of helps just keep me, keep me online. Um, if we go into the dog bone main, this is set to Z plus 0.01. That's just um, the language that this machine uses to, to tell it to cut uh, 0.01 inches below the bottom of the part. So it is going to get cut all the way through and another one of those windows is going to pop up letting me know that um, that I got to be careful because I'm going to be cutting through through the part. Um, it's the tool three, it's still the quarter inch bit and I use that because it can get in here and, and, and make these cuts that I needed to make without being too much of a diameter. Um, Let's calculate it, and there's the little warning letting me know. Yes, I know that. Let's preview the visible, and there we go. Now, if I zoom in on here, you guys can't tell, but there is actually a little shoulder there. Um, it's just uh, way too pixelated in, on, on my particular machine to really get in there and see that. But you can see that those parts are now cut out. Okay, let's keep moving on. Now we going, we're going to go on to the clip cutout, and this is going to take a little bit of explaining why I do this. Um, the clip cutout is that green layer that just popped up right there, and what it is is the cutting out of the actual um, tabs. And I use the quarter inch bit only right here because um, I, I like to use a bigger bit to do the main cutout of these parts. I can push it faster. Um, I've got a half inch diamond bit that I use to cut plywood out because the plywood actually dulls, dulls the, the carbide bits out pretty quick. The diamond bits list, last a lot longer. They're a little bit more expensive, but um, if you're cutting plywood out a lot, it's, it's worth it to have one of these. But um, I can't get a, a half inch bit in here to, to get in there and cut all these, these parts out. There, there'd be areas where it would miss. So I need to go in with a quarter inch bit and get these smaller areas cleaned out. However, I don't want to waste the time um, and the speed, uh, specifically the how fast I can put a quarter inch bit through three quarter inch material. So I limit the amount of time that I use that quarter inch bit. And so I use it just up here where I need it. I also use it, um, well, let's see the bottom ones. So this is part of the bridle joint right here. Um, and I use it in there too, again, so that I don't need to make um, giant uh, these are called fillets, um, and, and what these do is let a square piece of wood come all the way into the bottom um, without without getting held up by the regular radius of a bit. So this is that layer for me. When you see the clip cut out, um, that's why I do this. Again, if you can figure out a better, faster way, by all means do it, but I've found that the amount of time it takes in my particular on my particular machine to to change the tool bit real quick to get the quarter inch bit, um, I can still take the time to do a tool change, and it's made up for the speed that I can cut out the main cutout with the half inch bit. Um, so we don't need the cutout layer right now. Right now, all we're going to do is the clip cutout, and let's go into the layer um, or the tool path layer over here, and um, Again, it's the quarter inch. Um, it's the 
corner actually I'm, I'm using an end mill compression bit right here and um, the compression bit has an, has up cutting blades on the bottom of it and down cutting blades on the top so that as it is actually cutting through the material it's also not causing tear out on the bottom it's pulling the it's pulling the grains up through the bottom of the plywood and it's pushing them it's pushing the cut down through the top so I eliminate tear out on both ends using this compression bit um, but if you do have just a regular down cut bit um, if you have a nice clean uh, spoil board underneath there the tear out is is minimal with that so if you don't have the compression bit you can use a down cut bit and, and get away with it just fine um, I I push the down cut bit through in four passes uh, you could probably do three um, but it's all a matter of feeds and speeds at that point and um, the faster you're pushing the bit, uh, the more the more resistance there is on the bit, the the more deflection and the more likely it is to break. So um, this has just been a medium that uh, that I found to work pretty good at the speed that I that I pushed this through. And if we look at how fast I am pushing my bit, um, oh boy, I could probably pump that up right now. It's only at 100. I'm not quite sure why it's going that slow, but I'm gonna pump this up to. Um, Let's do 180 inches per minute. I think it could probably handle that. It'll just make the it'll just make the file go a little bit quicker. Worst case scenario, I break a bit, and then I know I need to back off a little bit. So, um, we're going to calculate this one again. The little warning is coming up, telling me that the is going through the material. Um, and let's preview what that looks like. All right, so there we go. This is the the beginning. We're about halfway through here um, of setting this file up. Now we're going to go to the tennis ball pocket itself. Um, this is, it's practically the same, I even have it colored the same way and it, matter of fact, is literally just, I just copy and pasted this just into a different layer so that I have more control um, when I'm setting up my tool paths. So we're going to go um, into the tennis ball pocket layer and now we're going to have a tool change here. I am going with um, the diamond in the diamond end mill it's this going to be the same bit that I used to cut the whole thing out and it actually does a pretty good job removing uh, what we're going to end up doing is removing this kind of um, peak that's in the middle of our tennis ball pocket because the tennis ball needs to fit in there nicely and now we need to remove all that material that's down in the bottom um, so I've got the cup depth to uh, 0.375 it's this exact same depth that we use with the V bit and that should um, work out pretty well after we um, after we cut that that bit out um, and what this looks like is this so there we go now the tennis ball will sit right in there um, and actually it'll be in between that's the bottom one this is going to end up being the top one and it sandwiches together and the tennis ball fits right in there and is held in place um, and now we're coming together um, the cushion pocket I'm not exactly sure why I ended up naming it the cushion pocket. Um, essentially what this layer is, is um, this area right here. This is actually the underside of the top seat and we've removed um, a lot of the wood that's in there because it really helps prevent um, a pinching hazard between the bottom plate and the top plate when you're sitting on it. If you were to reach around the bottom of the seat and tilt at the same time you could get your fingers stuck in there and this 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 operation just uh, helps reduce the chances of that so um, if we go into our cushion pocket again I'm using tool one because um, I, I, I've arranged it that way to try to maximize or minimize my my tool changes we've got this set up to 0.47 um, it's the diamond end mill and when we calculate this um, there's the tool paths that it's gonna it's gonna take and it's now removed that material and you can see um, that it's actually gone from there all right the cut out this is where everything starts taking shape um, this is pretty straightforward. The cutout layer is called the cutout layer because it's cutting everything out. And I've got all these little T's are tabs. Um, you can most likely, I'm sure, in your software, um, however you're setting it up, you can adjust these. You can change them when you're moving these parts around. If you find it's better to 
have less of them or fewer of them or put them in different places, that is all something that you're going to have to decide, um, decide in order to allow these parts to come off the machine the way that you want them. Um, with my particular table, some of these parts um, will actually stay in place without tabbing them. Uh, but it, the vacuum table is not, not in my particular case, it doesn't hold these parts down 100% of the time. Every once in a while, some, one will pop off. So I've just tabbed them. I find it's easier to, uh, I, I'd rather deal with sanding the tabs down than losing a couple parts every, every once in a while. So that's just what my tabs look like. Um, we're going to, again, it's the, um, the diamond end mill, half inch end mill set to Z plus 0 0.01, that's going to push it 0 0.01 inches past the, the thickness of the part, so it's going to get completely cut out. Um, and when we calculate that, the warning comes up. Um, and this little message here is just telling me that it's had to um, change some of the leads. And, and sometimes in my cutout paths, um, in my software, it gives me the option to um, have these things called leads. And what that does is allow the tool to engage the cut um, before it gets onto the actual tool path. And the benefit of that is when you're using a compression bit, the, the very bottom of the bit is actually an upcut bit. So when it just starts to cut the plywood, there's a little bit of time before the upcut gets buried in the material um, that it causes a little bit of tear out. So the leads allows the machine to, um, to, to do that part before it actually gets to the line. Um, and you can see that lead right here in the tool path. So it starts right here, starts cutting into the material, um, and it's up cutting, up cutting, up cutting, causing tear out until it gets deep enough. And by the time it's actually on my tool path, uh, it's deep enough so that the, uh, that the tear out is eliminated. And let's um, reset this view and see what that looks like. All right, there we go. This is the parts that are um, cut out and well, almost ready to go. We need to flip. We need to flip the seats. The the um, leg system themselves are are all set. They can get sanded. Um, we usually take them to a regular router table and put a, an eighth inch round over on all the edges just to. Um, and make them not so sharp and and we sand all the edges too so nothing ever really comes off the CNC completely ready to go it always takes some kind of sanding or rounding over or or both um, and that's that so uh, we'll change over to the video portion of this and you guys can see a sped up version of all these tool paths actually happening happening the way it happens on my machine um, and then we'll get back into the flip operations Okay, so let's, um, let's look at the flip operations. I'm going to turn all of the layers off that we don't need right now, and we're going to just look at the, the flip operations real quick. The flip rope track is um, it's designed so that the, that the bungee um, will not be sitting on top of the stool, so it, it won't actually be in the way. It'll be hidden. It just kind of makes it cleaner, um, uh, and, and a, a, it's just a better design. You don't, I suppose you don't have to do that, but it's also going to save the life of the bungee because uh, it won't be getting rubbed on all the time. The other thing that we do in the, in the flip layer is um, I use the V-bit again, T5, to go through and cut little grooves in the top of this, and it's, uh, it's just not as slippery that way. So let's start. I'm going to leave the cutout on so you can kind of see where these are. Um, and also, I suppose we should go into the flip registrations right now because this is the only way that really the machine um, will cut the parts in the proper place. Since we're actually removing them and flipping them over, we need to make sure that they're going to go somewhere and that the machine knows exactly where they are so that it can cut them properly. The flip reg reg registrations is how we do that. Um, if we take the cutout off, if we turn all these layers off, these are the, these are the registration holes. And if you remember... Um, they're set up to be 0.3. You can set them up to be a quarter. Um, I wouldn't go any less than that because the bungee, you're going to have a tough time finding bungee that's going to work. But if you have quarter inch dowels, then um, use, make these holes a quarter inch so that when you flip them over, um, they're, not, they're not loose. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, 
So we're going to go back up here into the flip registration layer, and I am at this point. Uh, this is this could be a little bit confusing, but right now I've got the depth set to one inch, which would actually end up being about a quarter inch deeper than the material. Um, typically, what I've what I've been doing lately is I change this to like a quarter of an inch, and and I do I do this flip registration um, in an entirely different operation. I take all my parts off the bed. Um, I have just the clean spoil board under there, and I will um, cut these um, registration holes only a quarter inch deep. That way, I'm not pushing the bit through three quarters of an inch of uh, plywood and then down into the MDF. Uh, they just tend to get hot, and um, I, 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 I don't do it that way. What it, what it also does is I can take these and, and move these holes anywhere I want, um, and as long as I've got enough room between parts. Um, I could line up uh, 20 of these and get them on the machine instead of just cutting these four. So it's just an efficiency thing. But for the sake of this um, demonstration, let's just let's just calculate let's just calculate these registration holes, and we're going to totally reset the preview. And now what we're looking at is just MDF. If we preview the visible MDF now you can see that we've got these holes that go a quarter of an inch deep into the MDF. What I do at this point is actually cut, um, I take my dowel or my um, road marker and and cut them down to uh, three quarters of an inch or so, um, even a half an inch might work, and actually stick them into the MDF and then I take the cutout parts, flip them over, and because the holes are in exactly the same place that they were on the part, um, the part goes onto the bed and it stays put. And again, this will be a lot easier to visualize when um, you're actually seeing it done on the on the video portion of this, which I um, can't remember if, well, when it's done, if it's going to be already done or not. So um, the flip registration is done and now it's just going to go in and we're going to be cutting the last two, uh, two operations here. It's the flip rope track. And um, I've got this down here. I use T3 for this. It's the it's the down cut um, quarter inch end mill. Um, and again, I'm not going all the way through the material. We're only going 0.2 inches deep on this, and that's enough to allow the bungee to um, lay underneath the surface of the top of the seat. And when we when we calculate this and preview it, we're looking at that. Um, again, these are these are actually going to be your parts on the machine. It's not. This is not in the MDF anymore. Okay, let's do the last 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 operation here. The flip scratch. Um, these are the grooves that help uh, help your bum stay on the seat. It is the um, V bit again. It's T5. I can use the very same bit for this operation and the other two operations that I use. It just helps eliminate tool changes. Um, I've set this depth to 0 0.05, so we'll definitely this one will definitely show up in the preview screen here um, a little bit more. So when we calculate this and preview the visible, that's what that ends up looking like. Uh, again, this is going to actually be cut out. So um, this is these are just individual parts. But that's it. That's all the layers. That's how I've got it set up. Uh, I'm sure this is still super confusing. Hopefully the video portion of it helps out a little bit. And um, uh, let us know if you guys have any questions or how we can make this better. I'm sure I'm going to be uh, redoing this very shortly because this is the first time I've done this.